so on that the, the topic of the, the problem of uh, public ciphertext, so we, we've solved that problem. I actually talked about that yesterday in our talk. I can briefly mention it here. I actually cut up most of that from this talk. But um, yeah, so to focus on applications. But I'll give you a super quick overview of PIGOS. It's a global peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encrypted file system and application protocol. Being a file system, everything has a unique path, which begins with your username, fine-grained access control, uh, it's pure capability based. You don't need to rely on a server to enforce these capabilities, uh, just maths. Uh, it's quantum resistant, uh, auto scaling, GDPR compliant, you get real deletion. Uh, so the, the, the public ciphertext thing, so we've added a new, uh, a new layer of access control at the block level in IPFS. So you can control who can even get the raw ciphertext blocks through IPFS. So we had to extend BitSwap for that. Um, and yes, so now your, if your, your data in PIGOS, only the people who you give a capability to to, uh, to to read that file can actually even retrieve the ciphertext. So we, we for, for, for years now, we had read and write caps, but now we have a lower one, which is mirror caps. And that's the thing that, that stops uh, the public ciphertext problem. So yeah, what do we what do we mean by applications? Um, so they they should be user run, user owned, uh, and possibly uh, unique in this view, but they should be untrusted. Uh, so apps shouldn't be able to exfiltrate private data. Uh, I should be able to take a, an untrusted app, run it over my private data, and not worry about that data being stolen or exfiltrated. Uh, apps shouldn't have to worry about identity or login or storage, access control or encryption. Writing apps should be easy, right? So our, our view of apps is an app is just a folder of HTML5 assets, which itself is stored in Pegos. So the apps themselves are private. You, you can make them public if you want, but by default, it's private. So you could, for example, charge for an app uh, by using the underlying access control. The only extra thing that's not standard HTML5 is just a manifest file, which is JSON, uh, with some metadata. So there, there are requested permissions, things like a title, icon, uh, this kind of thing. So this is, this is the execution model. So the, the idea is your, your end user is uh, logged into Peergos in the browser. And that's the, the main tab on the left, uh, the main, main context. And that's the thing that can get data from the network. Um, it doesn't, we don't do peer-to-peer -peer stuff directly in the browser for privacy reasons. For, we don't want to broadcast your IP address or anything like that. So that's handled by the server, but everything, the server is treated as untrusted. So everything the client gets, whether it's a hash or a signature or whatever, is, is checked uh, in the client code. And in terms of an app, so the way we do this, so we want to isolate different apps, both from the main peer GOS context where, for example, your keys are and, and your data, uh, but also from other apps. And as we've learned from the recent years, you have to worry about things like side channel attacks. So this absolutely has to be a separate operating system level process than the main tab. And that's quite hard to guarantee in browsers these days, but, uh, but you can um, with some recent uh, additions to browsers. And so the basic idea is we have a generated subdomain, um, and this works on localhost as well. So you don't have to have a, a wildcard certificate on a public server. Um, and the, the, the generated subdomain is basically a hash of the human readable path for the app that you're running. So those, those are the, the, they're paths in the PeerGOS file system, so those are unique anyway. Uh, the hash is then unique, and so you get your isolation that way. Um, you can also, within an app, you can add an extra like, isolation parameter to get a different hash as well, if you want. Um, so for example, one of our apps is, is a web browser uh, in the browser, um, and it wants to isolate its websites from each other. So it has an extra uh, the isolation parameter. Um, and so yeah, the basic idea is that by default, an app has no permissions. Uh, it can't do anything, uh, it, all it can do is read its own assets. And 
So the other critical thing is the, the green box, the, the, the sandbox there, uh, that's locked down so that uh, an app also can't make external connections to, to the web because um, that you could just trivially exfiltrate data. And so the idea is that the server uh, serves up the same static code for all subdomains and all that does is set up this service worker on the, on the subdomain which then communicates with the main peer uh, tab via post messages. And so then in the, in the peer ghost context, the, 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 the trusted context, that's where the app's permissions are enforced. Can it do whatever it does? We'll talk about what the permissions are in a minute. Um, and then, yeah, then that service worker then loads your app on the same subdomain, because uh, that's how service workers work. Uh, and as far as the app's concerned, it thinks it's just talking to a normal HTTP server. With, there's no encryption or anything. It just doesn't know about it. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've just talked about most of that. Um, yeah, so by default, an app can just read its own assets. App permissions, so if you want to have more, more, more interesting stuff, uh, you can grant an app a permission to store, basically persist data in your space. So this means uh, it's an app-specific folder. The app can read and write arbitrary files, whatever it wants. Uh, into, into that folder. So that could be save games or settings or whatever. Uh, another one is to edit a chosen file. So this means it's basically like the user says, I want to open this file with this app. And the app can then, uh, it, during that invocation, edit that particular file. Or there's another one which is read chosen folder. So that could be like a gallery or a music player or something like this. Um, so far, those first three, they're one player mode. So that's just you and your app, you and your data and your app. Uh, it gets more interesting with the fourth one, which is you can exchange messages with friends. Uh, and these are all, so there's, basically we, we already have a chat protocol. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's all encrypted. It's, it's uh, CIDT based inside the encryption on, on, on top of PeerGOS, but the app doesn't have to know about that. It just says, I want to create a chat uh, and with, with, with some friends who might have the same app installed. And you can then send asynchronous messages this way. So you could use that to do you know, multiplayer turn-based games or something. It's not real time. So you can't use it for network doom or something like that. Uh, we'll work on that one. Um, we do have plans for that, but not yet. Um, so yeah, this is, I mean, this is all hot off the press. Literally, we released this sandbox two weeks ago, so uh, there's lots more, lots more to come. Uh, if you want to read more about it, well, there's the Pyrgos generic link, but also apps. You can just go to our book, book.pyrgos.org slash features slash apps.html. And I'm going to try a demo. All right, so I'm logged into Pyrgos here. Uh, First of all, so I've already got two apps installed. What have we got? Uh, one is an image editor and a clone of Winamp. And so when you say, uh, you can also register for file types in, in that a manifest file. Uh, so for example, if I go, let me just, uh, let's see, this is some audio. So if I go down here, I've installed the, this Winamp app, uh, so I can now view this, this file, which happens to be a song uh, in Winamp, and we'll see if this works. And we'll see if my sound works. Does... Sound, sound over USB-C. <laughs> Godspeed. So that's, that's a Winamp app. Um, Uh, uh. <laughs> that's that's gone. <laughs> so yep, 
hopefully we're under the threshold for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's one app. Uh, what was the other one I had? It was an image editor. Uh, so let's go into media. We've got some images. Uh, okay. Uh, 2e image editor. So whatever. We can open some image editor. There's the image. We could whatever do some some stuff and edit it and save it. I, I won't go through that. Um, you don't. You also don't have to. You can run apps in place. You don't have to install them um, if they don't need any permissions. Um, so, for, for example, this is Doom. via J, JS DOS box. So you can see we're working our way up to network doom. This is, this is single player doom. But uh, anyway, you, 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 you get the idea. And this is so the, the cool thing with these apps is the server doesn't see the app asset. So the apps themselves are private. Um, uh, that might also trigger something. So let's close that. Um, <laughs> Question about uh, maybe I missed something, but where where exactly are those apps running? Is it just fully in the this, browser? This is fully in the browser. So and it's all uh, of the, the app in its entirety in order to run in a client is in my pure DOS file system. Yeah, it, an, app, an app is so I, so so these these are the apps here. This is pre some pre installing them. So I can show you. So for example, the image editor. Or if I wanted to create my own app, I would just go create a folder in here and then do whatever format. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, basically it has the assets folder, which is the assets. It's just, that's all the standard HTML5 stuff. Um, and then there's this magical file, the the manifest, the JSON file, which we can we can look at um, in another app, the text editor. Yeah, actually, you could if you could. Uh... Oh, show that manifest and sure. So you can with Pegos you can log in through any device. Uh yeah, what's the network path, I guess is what I'm saying. Is it through uh a, a, a pure server or is it that's the inside path? So every Pegos instance runs uh, and, and well, installs and runs its own IPFS instance, um, and everything happens via, via that. Yeah, so in the same way, uh, the Visual stuff boots up the JS IPFS in browser, mm -hmm. and you have your root SID, and every device would then just lean on syncing of the, of the uh, uh, IPFS protocol, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the content addressing piece, which is like, yeah. it is like, this is why we originally got excited about this. Uh, and so, yeah, the other, the other thing that's cool is, so you can, as I mentioned, an app is just basically a website. Um, so you can view websites natively in Pyrgos. So this is, again, this, these assets are served from Pyrgos. Uh, the server doesn't see them because they're all decrypted locally, but I've got a full website in there. And in, in a similar way that you can share anything in Pyrgos via secret link, you can also share websites. Um, let's see if we can do this. And I'm imagining there's a permission model for the friend that I share a link to my website to so that only Joe admin can access it, right? Or well, it's capability-based. So a secret link, anyone who has that link, the capability is in the URL itself. Okay. Uh, not, not, like, not tied to a DID or anything like that? No, pure, pure capabilities. You can revoke access by ro rotating keys. Um, and I the links myself. Just keep track, keep an index of the links and who I share it to, and then provoke it. You, so the, the secret link, that's mainly for sharing with people who are not on Pegos. If they're on Pegos, you can do in-band sharing. So this is the okay. sharing screen here. 
So I, I can type in the username of who I want to share it with, and this this remembers who it's been shared with, read or write or whatever, or you can share with groups, so there's friends or followers are the default groups, but you can also do custom groups. Um, but yeah, so the secret link, let's see if this works. Uh, We need, we might, I might need to, I think I'm going to need to adjust something first. So this is a secret link to a folder. So it didn't auto open it, but um, we, we can do that. And if I just take this link, so now it has the app that I want to open it with in the URL. So if I close that and go to another browser, we don't have any, we don't store any state in, in, the, in, the, in the browser anyway. So there's nothing shared between tabs. Then this should open the website automatically. And basically this is uh, the PeerDOS application running on desktop. Uh, well, this is running on PeerDOS.net, but this is just a, 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 yeah, you could run it on localhost as well. No, what I mean is, so you have to have the PeerDOS application installed? No. Okay. So this just works in any standard browser. Okay. Um, that's one of our things is we want any, anyone to be able to use it. So we, we want to avoid web extensions, uh, yeah. having to install stuff. That, that's a great thing. I think that's also very much one of the things that we said is should work in every browser, including mobile, uh, as our baseline. But in this case, all of the publishing and everything like that, you need to have the um, desktop app. So the web view is read only. I think it's more like a home server. Yeah, they have the, yeah. He's got a server that it forwards things to, so you don't have to run the node locally, right? Correct, yeah. Each user has a home server, which is responsible for storing their data and provides the current source of truth. Um, you can do offline reads in principle, uh, but not writes. Yeah. Unless you, well, so our plan for that is to do, do that on an application-specific level. So if an application knows it's using a CIDT, that's fine. You do what you want. But at the raw, what was I doing here? File system level, then yeah. All right, that's working. Thank you. Cool. Uh, that's basically it, I think. Um, No, so we don't run any anything in the browser because no. we don't want to broadcast IP addresses. Where is the so it's running on on the server. So you can connect through any server you like, um, and if you do any writes, that those will get proxied to your home server. Like, yeah. Basically, yeah. At least two things that I flagged, like, um, but uh, the manifest file uh, seems really interesting. Um, uh, that's something that I had in my giant list of random things I'd like to have eventually with, and just basically used HTML5 manifest file with a few extra, call it, vendor extensions that might be interesting for us to use. Is that kind of what that manifest file is? What are the, what are the extra pure last bits? Basically, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very similar to something like Android, so it'll have the permissions that you want, whether there's an icon for it or not. Um, and any like file extensions or MIME types that you want the app to register for, uh, the author, um, the install source so you can get updates. Uh, I'd, I'd love to figure out if, like anything that we can do to basically be like, we use the same format. Yes, right? or that would be good. Like that would be amazing. Yeah, because um, we just made this up. And, and especially yeah. if we do capabilities if we can uh, have some consistent language for some of that, that would be super useful. And, yep. and you know, like my thinking is the developer option, like, hey, if we've already got people who are using HTML5 PWA manifest files, then yep. we can consume all that. There's probably, and I'm not smart, smart enough about this yet, yada, 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 IPLD, something that comes in there, but uh, uh, <laughs> is that the correct answer? I, like, I feel like, hey. Yeah, just this IPLD data structure. And I'm still new, so I don't know what that means. Let's but that's just, what I heard. Let's keep saying those yeah. words until someone like fixes it. Once. Make it an IPLD structure. <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't understand what that means yet. Uh, amazing. Um, 
um, uh, pain. So, so I captured a couple from uh, uh, from both like bit swap challenges and browser support. Um, are can, <laughs> can you can you share some pains? Ian? Pains. Uh, yeah. What, what would you like to hard. not have to? do completely on your own? What would you like to consume upstream? What do you want to see from the IPFS ecosystem to make things better? What are you going to tackle or need to tackle on your own? The first thing I was going to say is not from IPFS, but more more primitives in web crypto. Um, mm. 825509. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe even some post-quantum stuff would be nice, um, but I'll give that 30 years. Um, I imagine just understanding a slight bit about the architecture. You know, you're hosting a server, which means load balancer, which means all the typical Web2 stuff. So if you could get rid of that, that would be great, right? But you're, you're not doing that because why? Uh, we don't have to have a load balancer. If you're self-hosting, well, you can, but your it's, your, it's your own server. Broadcasting your IP, right? So like, how do we solve that in IPFS so that you could just run an IPFS node in the browser? Right, so yeah, I mean, so we, thinking about this for years and basically, yeah, uh, the the kind of privacy we want from lib peer to peer, there's a, there's a group uh, some, did some work of this a few years ago, P3 lib on anonymity within uh, lib peer to peer. Um, something like that would be awesome. And so the way we would use that is, uh, you, you might've seen yesterday in our talk, we only really use the block API. Uh, we would have an extra parameter to all the API calls, which is the anonymity class. And that would basically determine the, the onion identity that, this, that that request would be routed through. And so you can, you can, the application can decide, I, you know, these, these bits of data should be not connectable by the external network um, because they're, for example, from different people and you don't want them to, their friendship connection to be leaked or that kind of thing, um, as well as obviously protecting things like your, your IP address. Um, so, so you're generally of the view that running IPFS as its architect today in a browser is just, just a bridge too far. I personally don't and yeah, wouldn't do that, yeah. I just want to get we've, that view out. I think it's a great view. We, we've heard that feedback. Uh, so there's the uh, Ink and Switch folks who wrote uh, really seminal local first software. Yeah. I'll actually add that to the links if you have read it. It's kind of a, it's essentially a manifesto for, hey, what if we wrote things local first? And in fact, it's a really good companion to thinking about apps on IPFS because you can see the architectural pieces, except their big issue with it is like, okay, cool, you've got an encrypted file system, but you literally, every single IPFS request is um, leaking, leaking requests yeah. for unique SIDs, yeah. um, and that seems problematic to us. Yeah. And by the way, you're like asking 600 strangers to come for it every time. Yeah. We could improve that. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> real. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got another um, question, um, and you might have answered this, but um, Pure Grass to me seems like it's focused on specifically on users for their data. But is there a story for, you know, this track is building apps on IPFS. So what about building apps on Pure Goss? Like, how do I build an app and share it, and then potentially, you know, profit? from some app that I distribute to Peergos users. Is that a um, Yeah, so, so apps, uh, they're just a folder of stuff on Peergos. And we, we, you know, it's a private file system. We have access control, so you can control access to your app. So if you want to charge for your app, for example, you can do that. We don't have payments in band, but you can do that out of band and just share, share the app uh, using the access control. Based on some payment system externally or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. 